Okay, we are back. Epis- no, Craig's gone. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Don't Say Um and Ah podcast. Sorry, the... Uh, there it is. Already. <laughs> Already. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> Leafs fans and hostile lands podcast. We had a goal to set up a Facebook page. Check. Follow us on Facebook. Really exciting. Young kids, I know. I know. Face. What is this thing? It's the same as Instagram, but old. It's fine. It crashed. <laughs> it was fine. Everyone survived. There's lots of new memes about it. We've got a website. Check mark. That's so exciting. Thank you guys for setting that up. I had nothing to do with it. Leafs fans and hostile lands dot com. It'll redirect you to our square site. We're gonna have some merch up there eventually. You can click on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you want to get your podcast. That's great. If you want to get it on YouTube, we got a YouTube channel started up. We're gonna have a cool graphic up, and it'll be really, really fun to get our podcast on those streaming services. But we have to talk about the thing that came out this past Friday: the all or nothing. Toronto Maple Leafs documentary that Amazon put out five episodes for last season. They followed the Leafs around, got as much footage and interviews and things like that. And I burned through it in one day. These guys burned through it, I think, today or yesterday. I I finished it about 20 minutes ago. We're going to talk about it. Craig's a little raw. (laughs) Craig is raw. My beer is ready as well. My five beers during the watching of that (laughs) documentary were ready. We have to start with Craig, though. Craig, initial reactions of the documentary detailing last year's stuff. Well, my short take is too soon. Way too soon. Still. (laughs) Thanks, Amazon. It it felt like it was like three days ago that we watched that. It's probably the closest thing I can describe to me having PTSD, rewatching that. It was a great series. I have a lot of respect for Sheldon Keefe now and his coaching style. Just, uh, you know, actually seeing him interact with the players. I have a lot of hope for the guys that are still in the room this year. And... It was an interesting series. I don't think it really conveyed the the feelings of the Stanley uh, the that playoff series, but it it was good. I enjoyed it. It was nice to see some of those players on a different level, on a more personal level. Uh, I think my favorite line of the series was when they asked William Nylander, "Where do you get your confidence?" I was born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Like, come <laughs> on, what are we talking about? <laughs> uh. Craig, can can we do that one again? I I feel like you were too nice. Like, what's happening? I, it like I said, it's still too, kind of raw. I could yell and I can scream, but at the end of the day, it the Leafs what the Leafs had the advantage in every single statistical category in that series, except for two. And that was goals and wins. At the end of the day, that's all that mattered, and it's the hope that kills you. And at the end of the day, Ten. there's an off season, then there's training camp, some preseason games, and we get to do it all over again. So, okay, okay, <laughs> that was that was a lot more held back than I thought. Maybe this was more therapeutic than I thought it would be. It was for me a little bit, you know, put the demons away, have a little cry at the end when with Jack Campbell, cry with him. What a guy! What a gem! I. That was the hardest part to watch, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. With Jack Campbell and at the end. He, he definitely doesn't hold back, no. like, as, as he shouldn't. I know a lot of the other players are trying to be big guys, and they're, they're holding it back. And some of them had to do interviews, including Jack Campbell, and they had their hats on in the shade yep. and held back. But Jack, ugh. And he keeps saying, this was the worst goal of my career in Game 7. Like, dude. Everybody has worse goals of their careers, and it's always game seven. It's, it's, oh, we don't put this on your shoulders, man. Yeah. Do I, not. I, I wonder if him and uh, Freddie can, can talk about that now. Yeah. <laughs> Having, yeah, Freddie going through that more times than Jack has now. That's, that's yeah. Jack's first. The first always hurts, right? Maybe. I think that was actually Jack's first playoffs. I think I, they said in the series. Wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. If he was on, 
the LA Kings before that, but not part of the Stanley Cup LA Kings. Daniel, initial reactions to the documentary? Yeah, I watched it. It was sad. <laughs> it was sad. <laughs> no, it I, actually. So maybe I'll I'll take over for the super angry Craig that should have been. I went through every range of emotion watching that. I watched it with my wife, and it was a really tough watch. At the start of it, I was angry because I knew how it all went. I knew that, yes, we had this great season, and I could pick apart right in the middle of the episodes, like, oh, this next game, they lost, and then they went on a slide, and this is where the power play died, and this, like, it just relived the whole thing for me, so I was angry. I, I was sad for losing people like Felino, who... Came on the team, he was there a week and a half, and then injuries happen, and Tavares happens, well, maybe a week and a half is a little short, but, um, you know, Tavares gets injured, Felino is the one that's the most passionate on the ice about it, he's the one that's the most kind of, like, pissed off, and I, I want retribution for this, and now he's gone, and it's like, those are the players we should be trying to keep, and I know it wasn't possible, but it kind of broke my heart a little, I was happy. Because I got to see behind the curtain a little bit back in the locker room. That was really interesting. I have a, a much larger respect for the entire coaching staff as well now. Just things I didn't realize were happening back there. I mean, the, the Leafs barber is like the godfather. He just gets all <laughs> everybody's secrets. And then at a certain point, he's going to be like, hey, I have all this dirt on all these players. And he's going to sell it for billions. I'll read that but, book. I, I will absolutely read that book. Oh, I hope that happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and I was crushed at the end when I had to relive that playoff series. And that is, again, where I shed a tear with Campbell. It was tough, but it was a good watch. Initially, I, I delayed as far as I could before our podcast to watching it. I didn't want to watch it, and I knew I didn't want to watch it for you know obvious reasons. But I did. I'm glad I did. But I'm still sad. One thing I liked is that they didn't make it about the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I agree. I like that too. Yeah. They easily could have in that last episode made it about the Canadians winning. But no, they solely yep. made it about the Leafs lo losing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. Well, I, I think, think Will had... Arnett had part in that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have to talk about the first line was. Okay. It happened it again. Happened again. <laughs> it's perfect. It was perfect. Yeah. And the numbers and stuff. Ugh. Could this documentary have gone any other way? If, if yes, you, not really. If, if you want an encapsulation of a Leafs season, any Leafs season, they've nailed it. This is perfect. Yeah, it was a perfect example of how we feel as Leaf fans. Yes. I think this was the perfect example of the nothing. This was not the all. And I think the all is, is still to come. And this could have been the all. Like, this team was so close to being complete. Ugh. Yeah. Just. But the problem is, it was a complete team. It was a good team going in. Even though we lost to Veras in the first game, that shouldn't, you know, you're, you should be able to lose one or two key players in a playoff series because of injuries, because of the, the intensity of the series and the games at that level. But. Losing him there, it was tough. And it's interesting that we added a lot of depth in the past couple of years. But interestingly enough, it wasn't at center. Tavares yeah. went down yeah. and was like, oh, God, we have a lot of great do do? third-line <laughs> centers. None of them are second-line centers. See, and, Felino and there seems could to be a large gap. So we, ah. we got Felino to be that guy that would slot in anywhere in the top six, anywhere in the, you know, all four lines he could have slotted into, and I would have felt comfortable. Unfortunately, he went down the next game. Yeah. Or two games. Like, he was out for most of the series, and yeah, he was not true. able to contribute. But with Johnny going down, with Felino going down, and, like, seeing his reaction to being injured was heartbreaking. Knowing that he yeah. was coming home, finally getting a chance to maybe run for a cup, and instantly getting injured as soon as he came in, and then aggravating it, and... Yeah, I, I feel really bad for, for Felino. And where did he sign this year? Was it Boston? Boston. Yeah, Boston. Yeah. For a lot and more money dad. than I thought it would be. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, like the Leafs would have, I'm sure, loved to have him back. And Alex was asking, oh, is he back again? I'm like, the only way that they made it work was to make two teams retain salary to have him for 
seven games. Like there's just no way of bringing him back. Two years in Boston for three point eight. The Leafs, it, the Leafs didn't have that much for Hyman. To yeah, bring him no, back. good point. It's, it's not even close. Like it's well, really unfortunate. Maybe Foligno will come back again. You know, as as a Spezza type or a Thornton type, but at this point, definitely not. Go yeah. ahead, Dan. You know, I asked my wife, what's her one takeaway from watching this? Because while she doesn't watch hockey, she loves documentaries. So she was very much into this. And her takeaway was, why do they keep trading away all their good players? If they have a good season and they like them on the team, why do they give them away? Why is there so much turnover? And so we, you know, we had a little bit of conversation about how contracts work and how you've got to balance the cap. And she immediately tuned out. But it was, you know, it, it's a really good criticism of of the team and kind of seeing it just through the lens of that uh, documentary. You know, we do take on a lot of these great players, Thornton, Felino, like, and and Hyman now that, and we just get rid of them. And I know there's a lot of good reasons for it, and I understand why it's happening. But it's still frustrating to see when we've built a really good core, especially when it comes to Hyman, because he has been a longtime player. To see them leave, it's 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 tough. Even some of the quote unquote dynasties of the the two thousands, even Chicago, L.A., Pittsburgh, in between those cups, there's a significant amount of turnover. But it's never yeah. those top guys. It's never the you know the top six, maybe one or two in the top six that are just kind of on the fringes. It's never you know the top two defensemen or the top goalie. Okay, for the Chicago it was once, but that's fine. <laughs> but it's it's those guys that contributed so much that they out money themselves. They the team can no longer afford them. It's like great, you you contributed so much to the Stanley Cup team. You've got a Stanley Cup. Go get your bill. Get your money. Yep. Unfortunately, it's not gonna be here. And that really sucks. And by the way, we're gonna win again. And yeah. that's you're not gonna be there. Like yeah. Miami, Buffalo, Sod going out of Chicago. Sharp. The whole third line going out of Tampa this year. Yeah. One team that didn't really have that problem was Pittsburgh. Um, they Pittsburgh had, did okay. Yeah. They had a lot of guys on one-year contracts that walked, but they were depth pieces. But their core has been the same. Yep. Um, LA was kind of the same. They locked up a lot of their guys. That's what put them into some situations right now. <coughs> with those now, big yep. contracts to going to people like Brown Doughty, and Kopitar. Doughty, Kopitar. Yeah, that's the thing. Brown but Brown the, is probably the worst one of those three. He had a good year last year, though. So hopefully he's he going to have a bounce like, back. But, but his, uh, oh, compared his to, role has changed. Exactly. But the difference between those teams and the Leafs is that the Leafs haven't done anything yet. Right. They are into these you know, post-Stanley Cup issues with, with contracts, but they haven't even gone through a first round. Yep. So I'm not going to say that, Crazy. you know, Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews don't deserve to get paid, but do they deserve to make the kind of money they are without actually winning anything? It, it's it. I'm I'm honestly asking. I'm That's not, a good point. Like, is where is? I'm trying to play both sides. Where of do you the, draw the line the, there? Uh, trying to play both sides of the Leafs fan brain, because people will say, "Well, they haven't done anything, so they get make the money," or they haven't. You need to keep them. They're going to get paid somewhere. It's going to happen. Unfortunately, we just happen to be the ones, not unfortunately, be the ones that drafted them consecutively and just have all these good players with these heavy contracts, which are going to weigh down the rest of the salary cap. Well, hey, on on the upside, we gain $1.2 million next year when we get to stop paying Phil Kessel. Oh, nice. <laughs> there. <laughs> Jesus. Hooray. The the big one or the big argument that we sometimes always forget is the pandemic happened and the cap didn't go up. Yeah. Yep. Dubas yep. sign these guys at this percentage of the current cap, assuming in five years it would be a much lower percentage, which is what Crosby did, which is what Ovechkin did, which is what McKinnon did. My God, McKinnon's making like what, six? Oh, he's gonna get Look, paid next year. He's gonna get paid, <laughs> but when he signed it it was a relatively larger amount of the cap, and that's that's fine. Mm-hmm. The cap has gone up. It didn't these past couple years. That sucks. Like, Does that mean we should let them off the hook? No. Yeah. Does that mean they haven't their dollar amount hasn't contributed to 
not being able to load up on the edges. Probably. It's probably a contribution. But the it, main... Like, if the, the salary cap pandemic. went up to $88 million, which it probably would be this year, what would the Leafs do with that extra $7 million? Would they have re-signed Hyman? Would that have been the best probably. way to do it? Or maybe yeah. upgrade on that first line left wing, spend maybe $5 million on somebody instead of $2.5 million on somebody. I bet you they would have already signed Campbell, but I bet you they're betting on Campbell finding like a middle ground or something now. It's like, is he going to have an amazing season? Crap, we can't pay him. Does he have an okay season? Great, we can pay him. If the salary cap was going up, they'd be like, screw it, just pay him. I, I would rather pay may take more risk like that. Campbell three and a half million and having eight point one million dollars in two goalies than having one eight point one million dollar goalie and Michael Hutchinson. True. Like yeah, that's you fair. actually have a chance to win every game with a solid tandem compared to a starting goalie and then ten games of a beach ball in net. Right. Hmm. Okay, we got off topic a yeah. little bit. Let's go back to the documentary. <laughs> this is you guys have already mentioned this a little bit, and I this is a point of contention for me. Your thoughts on Sheldon Keefe, you both kind of mentioned them that you have more respect for him now. I found the opposite. Now, this is absolutely because I didn't play hockey. I was never big into sports, so I didn't have a lot of coaches growing up. So I'm thinking, this guy is not a good leader because he's always focusing on the negatives. There's negative, negative, negative. Okay, boys, let's get out there. Or we can do this. And that's it. And it's negative. Fuck this. Fuck that. Negative, negative. Fuck that. And I'm like, dude, first of all, Let's get some better vocabulary in there. <laughs> Second of all, can you be a little nicer or something? Can you motivate in a slightly different way than you guys suck at this and this and this? I, I really didn't like Keith more after this. If anything, I liked him less. But again, I admit I'm not from this circle. Is this how coaches are like? And does it motivate these types of people? What do you guys think about Craig? You played house league hockey and <laughs> yeah. stuff in school. <laughs> Not quite the That's same, more, but more than more than I, you know, played in sports and stuff. But am am I on the right track? Is this guy not a good leader, or is he a good leader because this is what these players need? See what what I think of when I think of not liking the coach. I think of Scotty Bowman, who. Guys would say, I hated Scotty Bowman for 364 days a year. The other day of the year, we were hoisting the Stanley Cup. So maybe the type of personality yeah, that's that, well said. that you might not like might be exactly what you need to hear as a guy who is at the top of his game, wired differently to compete. He's not going to necessarily get better from praise. He's going to get better knowing this is what I'm doing wrong. This is what I need to improve. I personally would not get better under a person like that but i'm not a highly competitive pro athlete who lives every second of their life to compete to win and to be at the top of their game but they uh, don't even look like they're listening they're just sitting oh, there they're listening they're just um, not even looking at him they don't even look at him when he speaks it's just like duh, 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 duh. and then because they're just ashamed. berating them minus maybe the speech in episode five for game six Fine. Yep. I will give him that, and I just rewatched it. It was a solid speech. This is the time. We've been preparing for this. But the in-betweens of that was, this is the time. Why aren't you doing the thing that we've been trying? It's your fault. It's you. Your fault. Bad. Not, we need to do this together. This is our time. Let's go, guys. It, it seemed, it had the wrong message. The message was, you're not doing it as opposed to let's do it. I don't know. But also at the same time, he was so, like that all season and they won, what, 38 games of 56? And they looked like sure. they were having a great time. Sometimes with the coach, having a guy that you hate is what brings the team together. <clears throat> you can have that one thing knowing, fuck Sheldon Keefe. Let's show him what we can do. He doesn't think we can do it. Let's show him. I, Absolutely. There was I'm definitely that thing that the coach is the bad guy and the captain 
and the assistant captains are the good guys. And I think that yeah. is an excellent thing to do. And as a band director and stuff, sometimes I have to do that. I got section leaders and I say, hey, you guys are the good guys right now. I, get, I have to be the bad guy. And, and it has to happen. But it can't happen every single game. So I, I kind of disagree with you, Kyle, and I'm going to yeah. side kind of with Craig. Um, I did do a bit of competitive stuff throughout school, through high school. I did rowing, and that was gotten to fairly competitive there. And I found that we always did better with a coach like Keith. Um, maybe not to the extent of, you know, all the F-bombs and, and um, the super negativity. I didn't, we didn't get into that kind of, but we definitely grew more from what we were not doing right than what we were doing right. It was great to have a, somebody say, hey, you're doing a great job. Keep doing it. But mm -hmm. you don't get motivated. Like, it was hard for us to motivate ourselves if we thought we were the best, especially if we then lose, we get down on ourselves. So. I think having him, you know, kind of do that is was not a bad thing. It also seems if you kind of look at the other coaching staff and you also look at the players and how they talk to each other, it seems like that's kind of the culture of professional hockey. I've never played hockey myself, so I don't know, and this could be completely wrong, but it does seem like there is a culture of uber competitiveness. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of swearing in the, the locker room, which is not something I care about, but, you know, some people do don't like it. But he also, you mentioned his speech in um, game six. Yeah. He knows when to not do that. He knows when to switch gears, it seems to me, from I'm going to be really hard and kind of right down your throat to I'm going to pull you aside and talk to you. Like he pulled Matthews aside at the start. He also pulled Tavares aside a couple times yeah. yep. to kind of give coaching advice. And it's just, I think it's a balance, but... I think I came out of it liking him more. I already liked him for how the team was performing and the little snippets you'd hear after the games um, in interviews. But I do think I came out of this liking him more. I think that speech, he tried to switch back, you know, to not be the negative guy. And I think he did a bad job. I didn't think it was yeah. that great of a speech. It was better than his other ones. But I think he tried, but the message wasn't let's do yeah like i think i already said it, it wasn't let's do this together it was you suck see but i got the, chills now's the time. speech i i got mm. it sometimes now's the time stuff like that yeah for sure for sure but it was the stuff in between if you're really listening it's it wasn't great and but it wasn't motivating well maybe it was because they did the they, 13 shots on one shot again these guys the yeah, these guys are playing in the highest league in the world they aren't there to be coddled by their coach they're there for sure. him to tell yep. them this is how you can win and i think that is part just part of the culture a guy who's going to take a 100 mile puck to the face and continue skating probably doesn't want to be coddled it's just looking at the other coaches run the league they're successful look at these guys they are hard ass guys look at quenville mm -hmm. do you think he coddles his guys uh you know that john cooper doesn't yeah, Scotty Bowman obviously doesn't. He was the greatest coach ever in the history yep. of hockey. Yep. But you also have to think of the pressure that's on T Toronto as a team mm -hmm. to succeed and to get as close as they did to a playoff run and fail. Like that's that's massive for him. But do and they need that pressure? The players from the city, from the fans, from social media, and also from the coach. That's too much. It's consistency. At least, you know, if you're getting that message from the public, at least you're getting that message everywhere. They know that the amount of pressure that they have on them to win these games, to to be the Toronto Maple Leafs that everyone knows they can be. But if they're not performing, somebody has to be the bad guy. And as you said, I think sure. it was you, Kyle. Yep. You know, they're the bad guy. Get mad at Keith. Don't, don't get mad at your teammates. Kind of leave it all on the ice. Yep, yep, yep. I don't mind that. Craig, last words on Keith? I, I, I was going to go back to hitting on what you were saying about the uh, assistant coaches and the, you know, the captain, or assistant, it being mm -hmm. the, the good guys. Uh, in that, I think it was game seven, they were showing the scene when Jason Spezza was saying, we have everything we need in this room. We were built to be special. Maybe, no, no, that was uh, Felino. It was Felino. Felino was saying Felino. this. Yeah. They both said something fairly similar. I think it was two different games, but we have everything yeah. we need. Just go out and do what we know how to do. We know how to do this. We don't need any other words. We don't need a pep talk. We don't need advice. Yep. 
we won 38 games or whatever it is this season. We know how to win. Let's just go and do it. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter what you say to the guys. Sometimes it's just in their head. It's just, and look at the games. They didn't, pl- I don't think they played bad in games five and six. I know I've heard people say that they do. They did. Mm-hmm. I thought they played pretty well. They had bad luck and Carey Price played really well. Carey Price had a yeah a great yeah, series. Yeah. And I think that was the, contributed more than anything. And knowing that you can't get a puck past a goalie just seems to get into your head more than anything else. Yeah. Absolutely. And that wasn't mentioned. Maybe, maybe it was in the locker room. The thing that- maybe they didn't say Carey Price. But I, I know, I think Amazon wasn't allowed to have anything about other players. It had to just be Leafs. Must Nobody have been. else consented to this and stuff like that. Yeah. So they might have talked about it. But it was like, okay, turn the cameras off now or just cut this out later mm-hmm. sort of thing. I want to switch gears to Kyle Dubas, who was kind of the other guy that was focused on quite a bit in this. And I did like him a lot for the exact reasons I you know, didn't like Sheldon Keefe. I thought Kyle Dubas was more of a good guy. You know, he'd bring players in and would have that positive pep talk. The obvious one is when he brought Mitch Marner in after game six and said, hey, I just want to check in on you, see how you're feeling. Obviously, Marner's trying to brush it off a little bit, but he's a a child. There's also a camera in the room staring at him. Yep. Yeah, there's a ton of pressure. That's got to be really awkward. And the scene, I think, in one of the first episodes when they had Mikheyev in the room. Uh, oh, mm-hmm. we also should have mentioned. At the we also should have meant, mentioned at the beginning of this. There was lots of spoilers, so if you've been listening, spoiler alert from this point on. <laughs> <laughs> this point, on. yeah. Don't worry about everything else. The rest will be spoilers. Uh, yeah. So when spoiler, <laughs> we didn't win the cup. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, see that that was the sound I made through the entire series. At least that last game. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, but back to that and back to that interview quickly. He was just trying to see where he was and remind him he's a good player and say, you don't have to do more. You've been doing great things. It just hasn't gone in the net. Keep doing what you're doing. You don't have to put this much pressure on himself, which he didn't say. He didn't say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. He just reminded him he's a great player. And I thought Kyle Dubas played that role really well. The interactions between Keefe and Dubas were interesting, to say the least, and, and, and maybe sometimes combative, and I'm sure they might be more combative than the, what they showed on this. But with the players, Dubas was the guy, and I feel like every player on that team feels that Dubas has his back, maybe until he doesn't, because uh, Jimmy VC went out the door. But, you know. Yeah. But he did it in a good way. It, I think so. Yeah, I like the way that you mentioned that. Um, that's the thing that I thought of, too. There was the Jimmy VC moment when he said that he was on waivers. And he's like, it was very, you know, business. Sorry, Jimmy. This is just the way it has to be. Yeah. As soon as that door closed and he hung his head and it was just like, Shh, fuck. Like, I, yeah. like, you can tell that he doesn't want to do this. Like, that he yeah. has to keep it, keep it professional. But at the same time, he, he clearly cares about these guys. You know, it made me think of the scene in the movie Moneyball where Jonah Hill has to let go of his first player. And I was like, oh, my God, are they just recreating that? But <laughs> obviously, no, because VC got cut. So, yep. Anything else on uh, Kyle Dubas? Thoughts on him? Good guy, bad guy, or maybe not enough was shown or there's more behind the curtain? I'll just add that he he's exactly the kind of guy I thought he was behind closed doors. He seemed like a decent guy up front. No surprises. He seems like he cares about... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. He seems like he cares for the players. He gets involved in the players' lives as much as he can. It looked like when Tavares got injured, he was on the phone with his wife or his family very soon after that, and that, you know, that was an emotional episode. I don't want to get into that, but... Oh, it was tough. Tough to watch again. Yeah. I And... and if I ever watch this series again, I will watch every episode except number five because it was just too hard. It was a great four but... episode series. <laughs> it was. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. It was, it's, it, that last one was tough. Yeah. And it was fine until like the last 15 minutes. It's so quick yeah. at the end. 
And I feel like Amazon did that on purpose. Like, okay, we're building the series. This is great. This is great. Can't wait for the second round. That's how life felt. basically a promo. That's literally how life felt over those. It was just like, they're up three to one. Oh my God, what just happened? Like, where did those three games just go? Yeah. And And that was crazy because we'd come home and the whole day we'd be looking forward to hockey. And then we go home and all of a sudden it's over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and like, to watch other teams. And, and that's kind of what Riley said was just like the games just seem to slip away from them. All of a sudden you're like, you have lots of time to catch up and win this game. And it's like, oh, my God, there's only four minutes left. Like what? What just happened? Yeah. 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 Uh, last thing on Dubas, you know, after they lost and a lot of players were sticking around the, the dressing room, just heads down. Dubas was in there. You have no pat on the back. Shaking hands, whatever he needed to do, hugs. Not that Keith didn't do it, but we didn't see it. And so, that, that's the other thing. There's know. a lot of things you don't see. Like well, I, I, this I is an ep- I, edited I, episode. I don't know what kind of... I feel of, like that's something... Yeah. That, why wouldn't you want to put that in there? I don't know what kind of say the Leafs had in the final editing of this show, but maybe that was just mm-hmm. their narrative they wanted to, to keep. Good cop, bad cop. You've got sheep. Keith, okay. who's the bad cop? You got Dubas, who's the good cop, and maybe that actually is their yeah, relationship. I agree. They've worked together a lot over many, many years, so it seems yeah. like they have a dynamic that works. They've won a yeah. lot. They've won a lot of championships in different leagues, and it's clear that something something works with the way that yep. Sheldon Keith coaches. Yep. Uh, interesting last shot of the entire series. Just the. 2021, 22, the Toronto board. Maple Leafs, and the names on the board. And it had the four, the big four stickers, and Morgan Riley off to the side. And then the only person on left wing was Ilya Mikheyev. And everything else was off the board. It was just clean slate, except for these five. Yep. And interesting that Ilya Mikheyev was on there, obviously recorded well before the offseason really started. And there were the rumors about him wanting a trade, and he said no. So maybe... Maybe it really was a no because his name was up there. It like, was like, yeah, you're, like you're part of this. That's what I thought when I saw that was Keith said or Dubas said to Mikheyev, you are going to be an integral part of this team next year. I'm not trading you. You're not going anywhere. And seeing that, you can clearly see his intentions were right there all along mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you are going to be a part of this team. And my God, Mikheyev is so close to being good. <laughs> He's got almost yeah, everything he needs. Just. Yeah. Consistency. Yeah. Just he is uh, approaching expectations. Yeah. Just need some goals. He scored tonight to be Did fair. He? Nice. Oh, nice. Yep. Second goal. Richie two needs, goals. He scored one. Just needs that confidence. Just needs that confidence. Yep. Okay. There is a preseason game on right now. Dan's on the Dan's at the helm there. But we did have a preseason game earlier this week against our hostile lands fans. Lands fans, yeah. Uh, we're at about uh, 20,000 ums at this point, I believe. There should be a nice ticker going off. And what are we going to do? Quarters? Pennies? Pennies. We'll have to find pennies in the world, Canadian <laughs> pennies, luck. and we'll put them into a jar for every, every um or ah uh said on the uh, podcast. So we're going to get those numbers up there with the pennies. That's perfect. I've got like four pounds of pennies I'm looking at right now. That would be that would That's be perfect. For, <laughs> what do you do with them? I don't want to go to a bank. Are you kidding me? <laughs> go to society like a real person? No. Oh my God, seeing people. <laughs> never, never. That's your weapon at the door if somebody breaks yeah, in. Yeah, pretty. Well. I got the pennies. <laughs> <laughs> Just take them out. Okay, preseason game. This is the fourth preseason game. There was a solid gap in there where they weren't. They didn't have any, and it was against the Sens. And from what I could see. This was the Sens against the Marlies complete roster. Yeah, against yep. the yep. Marlies. This was kind of those bubble players. Like, hey, here's your shot. You're a top line guy now. The third line ish, you could say, was the top line of this game. I think it had Simmons, Spezza, Kasha, and uh, Kerfoot, I and think Kerfoot, and yeah, then Kerfoot. Simmons and Spezza yeah. were kind of the second line sort of thing. A bunch of other guys playing. Um. One of the things that stuck out to me, though, in this game was that the cross-checking penalties are definitely being called a lot more. And there was a statement made by the NHL saying, this is going to be called more. We need to stop this. You know, players are getting injured over time. 
It's not really part of the game. The refs have obviously been letting a lot of this stuff go. We're going to put a focus on it. We're going to put our foot down. And that was shown in this. One thing I noticed, Stutzla, cross-check, and it was kind of weak. It was <laughs> like a push. It's like he put a stick on the back and he pushed. I don't know. Is that a cross-check? It seems like a stick push. Based on the HL video, call. that wouldn't be. Yeah, I'd agree. Saying when and you then pull there was a back similar and load one. up, yeah. Yeah, you got to load up. Mm-hmm. You got to maybe not always break your stick, but if you break your stick, that's definitely <laughs> one. There was a similar one, Delzato. And you've got a weapon. On Hosang. And I don't want to say it, but it seemed like Hosang went down pretty easy, thinking that, well, this is going to be called if I feel a stick on my back. Oh. I'm going down. Oh. Maybe. Sorry, Maybe. I, I want to go back to all or nothing. That reminds me of that Winnipeg game the with, Thornton. with Thornton. Yeah, <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally we know yeah. what he was saying. I knew it. Yeah, when he looks at the ref and he's like, "He hacked You're in a my diver. You're a diver. or like he hacked in my knee. Do you want me to go down next time? I'll just go down. I'll just dive too. Apparently, that's what it takes to get a call. And I like when he said you to the do ref, "What you got to do?" Yeah, he's like, "When I, okay, fine. When I get out of this box, I'm gonna right, go right back after him. Okay, you do what you got to do." <laughs> Just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> he said it, and soon he walked. He went out of that box. He went straight after Ehlers in the corner, and <laughs> yep, Joe's a man of his and word. He went right back to the box. <laughs> <laughs> You're a diver. You're done, man. Oh, oh that was. I, I, I love knowing okay, what. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> hopefully, Ho Sang's not a diver. But cross checking penalties being called more. Is this a good idea for the game? I think Connor McDavid was one of the first ones saying, "What the heck's going on here." Is this is this a good idea? Well, let's mm-hmm. start with Dan. I think it is. Um, I mean, I, I'm certainly no... I, I don't love fighting in the games, but at the same time, I don't like dirty hits, and I feel like if you're hitting with your stick, you've got a weapon there. I know not every cross-check is, you know, intent to hurt somebody, obviously, but the the possibility of hurting somebody is there, and a lot of big injuries come from that. Especially cross-checking from behind. That's a huge problem. It's, it's kind of in my, the same mind as boarding in my mind. You know, that's something that could really hurt somebody. Take them out for a few games. Make a bloody lip. Whatever. I, I'm okay with it being a little bit more um, available to the refs to call cross-checking penalties. I'd, on the other side of that coin, though, you know, players have to respect it. They can't dive just because they got a tap on the back. So it's one of those really tough for the refs to actually call it properly. And I think we're going to see if they continue to call it as stringently as I have been in preseason, we're going to see a lot of people that are really upset with a lot of calls, but there's going to be growing pains anytime they start to ramp something up. And this year could see some of them. What do you think? Uh, Gregorino? I think it's a good thing. Shea Weber isn't playing this season because he'd be fucking <laughs> lost. He would have no idea what to do in front of that net. <laughs> ben Sherrod is screwed this season. Uh, I, I, one thing is definitely going to benefit the guys who get those greasy goals in front of the net. They're going to have a little bit more space. They're not going to be cross-checked continuously, you know, standing in front of the blue paint. And guys like Michael Bunting, I think, are going to be the guys that are going to benefit from things like this. Uh, he's going to you know, have a little bit more time and space in front of that net and not worry about a guy like Ben Sherratt, you know, breaking a piece of lumber off his spine. I, I think it's a great thing. I think it was a big problem last year in the playoffs. I believe it was a Tampa player that got injured. I'm trying to remember who it was now in, uh, against the Islanders. And they used that as the exact example, saying this is the kind of cross-check that is not going to be acceptable. And it's only going to increase safety. Like there are guys that are getting injured. I know a couple times Matthews looked pretty uncomfortable coming out in front of the net after getting a few cross checks. And I think it's a good thing for the game. Anytime that it's going to increase safety, create yep. some more power plays. I don't care if it's which way the power plays go. It's exciting hockey and more goals are more goals. As long as they're not making yeah. makeup calls I agree. on top of it. Yeah. But yeah, that's a whole different yeah, conversation. Yeah, they can't that. balance it out. Whole different conversation for maybe another episode. That's interesting. I didn't think about that. If this is getting called more, are the refs going to feel like they need to make those makeup calls and make easier calls on other types of penalties as well? Or Oof. make less calls I... on other penalties. Just let the slash go now. 
It's like, oh, we're calling yeah. cross check, yeah. so we'll let the, the hooking in the hands go. Oh, that's for two minutes for swearing. <laughs> that's a lot of players in the penalty and box. And Keith was <laughs> never seen again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, never seen a whole team in a penalty box. Oh my yes. god! <laughs> uh, very quickly, any specific updates on some of these bubble players? Dan did a great job putting the stats up for us. Looks like Michael Bunting's doing great with four goals. I know that he had that power play hat trick day. That was beautiful. And Hosang four assists so far. This this is good. Maybe Hosang has a chance of making it. Any other things you guys are seeing with some of these uh, bubble players that uh, maybe change your mind about some of the stuff we said last podcast, Dan? I mean, I wasn't huge on Hosang starting out, but the numbers speak for themselves. He is definitely trying to get there. He's trying to be relevant to the play. He's getting in there when it's uh, dirty in front of the net, and he's putting up the numbers for it. So, you know, he may very well see a position this year, maybe not opening night, but, you know, I think maybe with the Marlies and then be called up, who knows? It's looking promising. Uh, you know, I had Sandine on this list, but he's pretty cemented on the team. I, I think we're going to see a lot of him play. I hope so. And then Bunting is really impressing me. I think that was a great addition in the offseason. I think uh, he's going to be a lot of fun to watch this season. Four goals so far. He's in every play that when he's got the puck. It's uh, fun to watch him. Looks like Richie's doing well tonight, too. So add him to the list. Two goals so far for Richie, but I think also he's he's more cemented in you know first second line than anybody else. I, I don't know if I'd bubble him. I, I agree. Uh, I think Michael Bunting will be a good addition to power play, either one or two. Not uh, being that guy in front of the net, play those. You know, obviously he's shown that he scored three power play goals. I would love to see Josh Hosang sign with the team, especially if it can be a two way contract with the Marlies. I really would like to see him yeah. get the Alex Galchenyuk treatment. Bring him in going, Mm -hmm. we know that you're a good player. We want you to know our system. And here's a month or two down in the minors. Learn the system. And then when there's an injury, you're the first guy up. Or if someone's not working out, let's say Michael Bunting doesn't work out. Maybe we want to bring in someone like Hosang to be on the power play. Because obviously he looks like he's pretty comfortable on the power play as well. Yeah, beyond that, I think Sandine is pretty much locked in. I know Engvall had a goal the other night, but I don't know where he fits. Comp with a couple goals. Uh, like he said, yeah. he doesn't care what he scores for points, but the coaches seem really impressed with him. him. Beyond that, mm-hmm. everyone else, I don't... I They can go yeah. one way or the other. I think there's going to be a lot of those other guys on waivers. Keith had good things to say about Kasha. Oh, yeah, he's been good. He's been noticeable, yeah. which is good for that amount of money. Definitely a player to watch. Okay, that was a quick little update on the bubble players there. One of our star players, Matthews, he had wrist surgery over the summer break, small break that they had, and it actually uh, stopped him and Marner from training together in Arizona for the first time, so that's something. Do you guys think this was a... Good idea for him to get this surgery, or maybe a bad idea because maybe he won't come back as early, or there might be complications or something. I don't know. I don't know. Good, good or bad that he got this surgery, Craig? At the time, it was maybe questionable, but he's already back and shooting and apparently feeling pretty good. So it, with hindsight, you know, helping this one, it looks like it's a good move. I don't think that he would have done it if the Leafs thought or he thought it was a bad idea. It sounds like it was kind of a a fairly minor thing. It wasn't, you know, anything reconstructive. It was just cleaning up an old injury. But if it means that his wrist is going to feel good this season and he's going to feel like he did in the first 30 games last year, it it, it definitely can't be a bad thing. Well, unless it, you know, you can always think like scar tissue and things like that surgeries you never know they can come back and bite you and you're out for maybe longer i i'm I'm, i don't believe this i'm just playing devil's advocate yeah sort of thing i'm thinking with the six week turnaround on this surgery that it's got to be something pretty minor okay gotcha that's what they originally said not a doctor but i'm only a nurse so (laughs) (laughs) hey you deserve just actually you deserve just as much respect well i guess actually dan megan does maybe a little 
It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also okay. quickly point uh, out that the Leafs are out shooting Montreal 40-14 in shots right now? That's the best thing I've heard and since they lost. And winning 6-2. to two. Yeah. And we just had a beautiful goal from uh, a penalty box uh, finishing the penalty, and he came out and scored. It was gorgeous. Oh, that's beautiful. Brett that's Sini, beautiful. add him onto the list of uh, of players. <laughs> of potentials, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dan, anything about uh, Matthew's wrist injury we should touch on? Uh, I, I just think now's the time to do it. I mean... Yeah. Why wait until things get worse mid-season, gotcha. get it done in the off-season? Uh, if there's a problem at the start of the season, at least it's not when we're trying to build points in the at the end of the season uh, to get a playoff spot. It's now, so they can figure it out. It's yeah. a good time to do it. I'm just intrigued why they didn't do it like right away. Maybe they didn't think it was that bad, but he yeah. did a little bit more practice, did a little bit more playing after the the playoffs and realized that it was kind of do or die. Either okay. now or mid-season. It's now or never. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, there's obviously a developing story with Jack Eichel and the Sabres. Robin Letter getting in on that. We're going to postpone that conversation to next week, maybe, as things continue to develop. Just from my perspective, I hope Jack Eichel gets what he wants. It's his body. It's his choice. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, there's contracts and things involved. Leonard is speaking out about this, saying, hey, what the heck's going on? Stop trying to control him. Let him... You know, do what he thinks he needs for himself. Let's and and get him back on the ice. Like let's let's do what we can to get him on the ice. But again, we're going to talk about that soon, and maybe uh, comment on Instagram what you guys think is going to happen with Eichel and the Sabers. We will continue to talk about that. Maybe a bigger section uh, next week. We got about ten minutes left. Maybe a little under. We thought maybe as we continue to try to get more subscribers. We give you a little bit of more insight into us as the humans. We are humans. Did you know this? We are not aliens. Leaf fan aliens in hostile planets. See, what? I'm even learning something. I was sure you were an alien. Okay, fair, fair. That's fine. I understand why you might have thought that. Human bodies <laughs> don't look like that, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working out, man. I have been totally working That's out. That's not what since I'm talking about. It started. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I'm hairy. <laughs> okay, no one needed to know that. Oh, moving oh. on. All right, we're just gonna do what are what are our favorite things? These are a few of our favorite things. <laughs> uh, we'll just go around quickly. This is our quick uh, question segment. That's never as quick as it should be. Daniel, what is your favorite movie, TV show, YouTube channel, podcast, or all of the above? Okay, so I, 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 to be, this is strange, but I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, so I'm not going to even comment there, other than our own, which everyone should subscribe and like, because of course. Uh, course. But in terms of movies, The Martian for me, I'm a big space nerd. TV shows, The Office, I love the witty humor in it. And then for YouTube channel, I really like uh, Stuff Made Here, Scott Manley, and uh, Veritas, which is a lot of like learning ones, you know, kind of building things, cool shit. That kind of stuff. Greg? Well, my favorite movie, and Kyle, I'm sure you'll say the same thing, possibly, is Lord of the Rings. My favorite TV, we sh- did it. favorite TV <laughs> show is Futurama. Parks and Rec is my favorite live action. Just so overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. yeah. And my favorite podcast, I love Hardcore History. I love getting into 36 hours on p- the Pacific War or say. something. <laughs> also been listening to one right now called Ologies, where... Uh, they interview a different ologist every episode. Very informative. You know, great educational podcast. Very fun. Very fun. Movie, Lord of the Rings, all of them. Mostly Return of the King. <laughs> TV show, I am such a nerd, and I really tried to narrow this down, but I gotta say, Dragon Ball Z. Love oh! Dragon Ball Z. Love. <laughs> nice name drop. You know what? Dragon Ball Super was awesome too. GT, somewhere in the middle. YouTube channel, Golf Sidekick. Love that guy. Big fan of golf. And uh, podcast, Steve Dangle Podcast. Got to give him a shout out. Don't forget to add us on the Steve Dangle Podcast Network. We got one day a week. So do you. <laughs> <laughs> snack food. Craig, favorite? I'm not really a big snacking person. I would just say Triscuits. Okay. Yeah, it, okay. I, I'm incredibly bland. I dig it. I dig it. Dan? Uh, I'm going to go with Miss Vicky's Chips, any brand. Nice. Any flavor. Any flavor. Nice. 
Uh, ketchup chips for me because I'm so Canadian. <laughs> yep, that is super Canadian. <laughs> Favorite beverages, alcoholic and non-alcoholic. If you didn't know, we are above the age of majority, so so we are allowed to drink alcoholic drinks. Big fan of the beer, mostly the craft beer, sometimes from Cover Bridge Brewery. And non-alcoholic, chocolate milk because I am, as we mentioned before, a child. Uh, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> alcoholic would again also just have to be craft beer since I do work at a brewery and non-alcoholic I guess just milk yeah again Sweet. I'm a child <laughs> oh my god you guys are boring I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with scotch and coffee like a real guy and say that I get my scotch on in the evening and my coffee on in the morning to get me going sometimes they switch <laughs> Daniel, uh, music genre, band, or artist, your favorite? I, I'm going to go with favorite band, and I'm going to go with Chili Peppers on this. I grew up listening nice. to them. I love their entire discography. Uh, the only thing I haven't done is seen them live because they came to Ottawa right before the pandemic, and it was just not going to work. So, yeah. you know, uh, they're going to be the next one I see. Correct. Well, I kind of listen to a little bit of anything rock and roll. Uh, I have to say my favorite band is the Beatles. Possibly, yep. at least for anything that is older, my favorite modern band would be Thrice. I would say it's, they are the Beatles of this era. You know, anyone can fight me on that, too. And... <laughs> yeah, I will absolutely fight you on that. They are not the Beatles of this era. Oh, Craig, we forgot to fight! Ah, oh, darn! Okay, next time. Next podcast, Craig and I are fighting, and then the one after that, Dan and Craig are fighting. <laughs> Should we just save that for our live in-person one uh, next week? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's a, that, on that's a good intermission. <laughs> Winner takes on Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, music genre band artist for me. Well, that's really tough because I am a music teacher and a performing artist sometimes. I also have to go with Thrice. Craig and I have played in a band before, and we've played lots and lots of Thrice. Can't get enough, can't get enough. But I was classically trained, so classical music I listen to often, and I'm a big fan of Shostakovich. Oh, I forgot to write this one down. Any music from Final Fantasy, of course. If <laughs> oh, I'm marking, yeah. Marking no, I'll, stuff. Get, I'll get you there. Final Fantasy. I did my master's thesis on Final Fantasy music, so, you know, hit me up if you need that. <laughs> Speaking of school, Craig, favorite subject in high school? I think it was history. Which clearly leads into my favorite podcast, Hardcore History. I could just sit there and listen to our high school history teacher talk forever. And that's pretty much all I did because I didn't take any notes. <laughs> <laughs> I got a 95 in the class. Damn. so <laughs> There you go. Tim. So I, I was going to say history, but I'm actually thinking I'm going to switch mine to anthropology, sociology. Cool. Uh, I really like the study of people. Um, really like getting involved in their lives and making them change for the better. So, you know. Nice. Nice. Uh, no surprise. My favorite subject in high school were music and math. That's what I teach now. But honestly, now that you guys say history, one of my favorite classes was American history. And I'm so glad that course mm -hmm. was offered. It was a really, really great time with the teacher. Same idea. I just listened a lot more than taking notes. Did pretty well in the class, sure, whatever. But it was like really, really interesting to uh, compare the two histories, and I'm glad they're being updated in our schools as indigenous issues and things are becoming more of the forefront. Let's learn more about things like that. Kyle, favorite sports other than hockey? Golf, 100%. Moving on. Dan? Uh, I'm going to say baseball to play and curling to watch. Interesting. Craig? Can, can I just say hockey? <laughs> no. Daniel, favorite NHL team other than the Leafs? I already know the answer, but go for it. <laughs> so it's going to be San Jose Sharks. Very good. And it's the old school San Jose, the third and the Pavelski era. Nice. Craig? I grew up for a long time as a kid as a Colorado fan. I was a huge fan of Patrick Waugh. And I still have a soft spot in my heart for the Colorado Avalanche. And having Nazem Kadri over there right now just kind of Gives an extra soft spot, so they are my are they my pick. Nice, nice. Uh, I guess growing up, I liked the team that won 
<laughs> so the Leafs did that sometimes, and you know it was cool because I was close in proximity. But Detroit Red Wings for me. I was gonna say, I you must have been a Red Wings Iserman. fan. Good choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Loved Iserman, Shanahan, and then when they stacked up and got like Chelios and oh, that was a good Lindstrom, team. and I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's so, a dynasty we, team. We need a salary cap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were great. I'd say now though, ah, oh, and I kind of hate to say it, but again. I love those good players. I like Edmonton, and they sometimes feel like the Leafs of the West. Ooh. And McDavid is fun, and Drysaddle is on my fantasy team, and he keeps getting me those wins. So I, I like Edmonton. They're fun. You just care about the fantasy. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, favorite Leafs jersey of all time? I think it has to be this one. This jersey is Damn. just the accumulation of all the great things over their history. That's my answer as well. Dan? Oh, I'm going to stray from you guys. Uh, so for me, it's the 92 to 97, which is kind of when I got into hockey uh, with my dad. So it was the solid Leafs logo, just the plain kind of uh, maple leaf on the front, no frills on the corners or anything, just the points. And then the new Toronto Maple Leafs logo on the shoulders with the stripes on it. Really classic jersey that I, I just love to this day. Fun. Oh. Can can I change my answer to like the Dion Phaneuf one with no stripes anywhere on the jersey and just like oh, looks like a pajamas? Oh. <laughs> that, that 2007 Reebok Edge that that was just perfect. Like they should not have changed from that. <laughs> the sarcasm is oozing, <laughs> and that was oh, the TML on the shoulders. Yep. that wasn't the the Leaf logo. That was the TML. Actually, one. I don't oh, even think they God. had that. I think it was just blank. <laughs> <laughs> It was oh, they were terrible. Those were bad. It was raw. Uh, Kyle, favorite Leafs moment of all time. I couldn't pick one because my memory sucks. But <laughs> I really liked when I was younger, and the Leafs and Sens would always meet in the playoffs, and the Leafs would always win, especially when the Sens were like the first seed and the Leafs were the eighth. No doubt, Leafs were winning, and they did every single time, and the Sens only went to the Stanley Cup when they didn't have to go through the Leafs. So those are some of my favorite Leafs moments. Uh, Dan? So I have two. Uh, I'll be quick. My first one is I was at a Leaf game with my dad, and the puck flipped over the edge and landed a few rows in front of us. We were pretty close to the front, and some other kid got it, and I was devastated. So at the end of the game, he bought me one, but... Because my memory sucks as a kid, I thought it was the game puck for for like fifteen years. <laughs> so only in the last like t- ten years, he said, "No, no, I bought you that at the end of the game, so you weren't sad." So that was my favorite leaf cut of memory growing up. But also, uh, my other favorite leaf memory actually happened this year when Campbell won his eleventh game. That Just cool. seeing that joy on his face uh that he set not just an nhl or not just a leaf record but an nhl record and to be part of that if i can't win a stanley cup with them that was a really great moment for me that was pretty good uh i think one of my favorite moments similar to what you were saying dan was when i was a kid and i got to go to the maple leaf gardens and watch a hockey game yeah I think it was the last season before they closed, and the Leafs lost 5-2 to Phoenix. Ugh. Oof. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you don't forget. My other favorite memory, and I believe it may have been in the playoffs, and Ty Domi was in the penalty box, and the guy was harassing him, and then the glass fell in, and the guy fell oh, into yeah. the penalty box with Ty Domi. <laughs> <laughs> That is classic. That is a like place that, into the that shark tank. Great choice. <laughs> that, that's a, exactly that is a place that you do not want to be anytime. But uh, that, that's just one of those weird in a box with Ty Domi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trapped in a box with Ty Domi after you just sprayed him with water. But yeah, that's I just completely one... regret this decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How oh, was I supposed to know there be uh, consequences for my actions? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before Twitter. Oh, wait. <laughs> Last question. Favorite moment on this podcast, Leafs fans in hostile lands so far? Daniel. Uh, so, so mine's pretty easy. I mean, mine was when we looked back, we looked back at the year we'd had and picked a few moments from that to talk about. So much. I, I really enjoyed that podcast. That was a fun one. Greg. 
I think my favorite moment was uh, the last podcast of the season when we were looking to the next series against Winnipeg. That was a great oh. moment when we were saying, oh, you know what? God, They've yeah. won two in a row. They just came off a, a shutout. So this is how they're going to play against Winnipeg. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was rough. Uh, oh, yeah. Those podcasts <laughs> were a, a week apart, and this series completely changed. Yeah. It went from, oh, oh so we're looking to the next series, to, uh... <laughs> oh, to what the God. hell just happened, guys? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, my favorite moments, absolutely selfish. Totally selfish moments. And I play this one all the time was the cold open about the stupid fucking mic stand. I laugh at that one <laughs> all the time. And I'm like, Kyle, that was comedy genius. And the other one, again, selfishly, was the one where I added a bunch of cool music, and I made up most of that stuff on the spot when I was editing. That I thought was that was cool. fun. That was fun. Even though the podcast itself was really, really sad because they just lost game seven. But I, I thought it was a good time. I, I had a good time with that. Anything else? To quickly wrap up this nice long podcast involving the documentary preseason and a little bit about us. Go Leafs Go. Oh, you beat me, Craig. <laughs> go Leafs Go. Go Leafs Go. Also, Craig, great job with editing last time. That was so cool with the film. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was well timed. Try again. Nice. No. It, it happened once. <laughs> Lightning doesn't strike twice. Except for Stanley Cups. <laughs>